words from the gospel. It is finished. In the name of God, source, word, and life-giving spirit. Amen. On Palm Sunday, we spoke about the cross as a sign of God's love, forgiveness, and freedom. Jesus on the cross is the human face of a God who continues to love and forgive us when we do our worst, precisely because God is free to do what God wants. But the gospel also speaks of the cross in the language of sacrifice. In that phrase, Jesus died for us, we know those two words those two words for us are a sign of God's love for us. But the phrase died for us is also often accompanied by the words died for our sins, died as a ransom for many. One of the oldest confessions of faith from Paul's letter to the Corinthians says, what I received I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. And it is this type of language that we're going to try to make sense of today. How do we understand the cross as the place where Jesus died for our sins? In the history of Christianity, this language of Jesus dying for our sins, dying as a sacrifice, was pushed into a legal context, specifically the medieval court context. The event of the cross was understood as some sort of great law court where we stand condemned, but because of Jesus on the cross, we get to walk out free. But that is not the context from which Paul or the earliest Christians wrote. And I think it's best that we move away from the legal language of sacrifice. The earliest Christians understood the language of sacrifice another way, from the context of the temple in Jerusalem. Their language of sacrifice was understood through the temple, like when we see Mary and Joseph offering two pigeons at the birth of Jesus. Or, like when we think in the temple how a lamb was sacrificed both day and night, an event to remember the time when God spared Isaac, Abraham's son, by providing a lamb for sacrifice. So, temple sacrifice was, the system of sac was a system of sacrifice where when blood is shed in God's presence for the sake of God's people, a gift is offered that would make peace with God. Today we don't find it very easy or very comfortable to come to terms with the language of sacrifice. The idea that we would give God the gift of an animal's blood doesn't quite sound like the God of the New Testament or the God we meet in Jesus. What sort of God are we worshipping that they would need the gift of blood anyways? And you know, even before Jesus walked the earth, our Jewish ancestors had figured out that God doesn't really need the blood of animals. A psalmist, reflecting perhaps in a satirical tone, asks, do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? And the prophets themselves critique a system of sacrifice that does nothing to change a person's behavior. The prophets say, you are expert at sacrificing things. Why is it so hard for you to sacrifice your heart? So already we are moving away from an understanding of sacrifice as a way to calm God down, a way to keep God happy. The gift of a sacrifice that makes peace with God has to be something deeper than the blood of a lamb. Already there is a sense that Sacrifice must stand for something. That sacrifice must be a metaphor for something. That the language and way of speaking about sacrifice is a way of speaking very deeply about something between God and God's people. 
The former Archbishop, Archbishop Rowan Williams, suggests that for us to understand the language of sacrifice, the language that Jesus dies as a ransom for us, we must understand that the real heart of sacrifice was obedience. He writes, what is the greatest gift we could give to God? That gift is our hearts, our wills, our decisions, in other words, our obedience. And it is through the lens of obedience that the sacrifice of Jesus begins to take shape. Jesus' death was not a ritual sacrifice, but a bloody execution on a bleak hilltop outside Jerusalem. But Jesus' death is a sacrifice of obedience, because at every moment of his life, he has given his heart to God in such a way that God is able to work through him with no interruption. He and the Father are one. At every moment, Jesus has fulfilled the law, not by ticking off at the end of a day a series of acts performed, not by obeying God like a reluctant soldier with a sergeant ordering him around, but at every moment, Jesus has done what God wants. The Archbishop concludes that even before his crucifixion, we could say that Jesus was offering a sacrifice, giving his heart to God in such a way that God is pleased with the gift. I think understanding sacrifice as obedience also helps us to understand why Jesus ended up on a cross. Jesus' single-minded gift of his heart to the Father leads him to the cross because obedience to God in this world of sin, oppression, and violence puts you lethally at risk. The Archbishop puts it this way, this is a world in which if you try to give your heart to God, you may find your blood shed. And that seems to make a lot of sense to me, especially when we reflect on all the people who have suffered death by calling to account systems of oppression and injustice, or who simply end up advocating for the marginalized and forgotten in society. Ours is the kind of world where those people who have risked themselves for the sake of others, sacrificed themselves for others, we could say, have had their blood shed. So we have seen how Jesus' life, understood as a life of total obedience, can be seen as a sacrifice up to and including his death. But there's one more aspect of sacrifice that the church has come to develop. Sacrifice as obedience to God required a little bit more elaboration, and Christians started to ask themselves, well, what is pleasing to God about obedience? What is it that God sees and responds to in our obedience? How does Jesus' gift of obedience please God? And again, looking at the cross, looking at Jesus on the cross, the answer took shape. What is pleasing in obedience is that God looks into our world and sees a reflection of God's own love, God's own glory, God's own beauty, Simply what pleases God most is God, and God loves to see God's selfless love reflected back, to see God's beauty mirror, mirrored back, to see God's glory shining forth. And in Jesus' gift on the cross, we see the perfect gift of God, because we see the return of God's own holy, generous love. The Archbishop writes, Jesus' gift on the cross is the Son watching what the Father does and playing it back to him. It is Jesus saying that he does what he sees the Father doing. It is the divine action of love mirrored back. And so the Archbishop concludes that the language of Jesus as a sacrifice draws us right into the Christian understanding of the Holy Trinity. We see the Father pouring out his love, the Son watching what the Father is doing and playing it back to him, the Spirit enabling us to share that response to the Father. <laughs>
watching and loving. On Good Friday, we see Jesus on the cross. But in this sacrifice, we see no less than the Trinity, the life of God poured out, the life of God reflected back in love from the earth, and the breathing of that life freely to the ends of creation. When we think of Jesus on the cross in this way, suddenly the meaning of Good Friday becomes a little bit more understandable. We see the goodness in the gift of this sacrifice. We see the goodness of God's love poured out, reflected back, and breathed forth. We see that, through Jesus, that though Jesus' life is finished on the cross, the sacrifice of his obedience to God cannot be defeated by the cross. In life and death, he has been good. And soon we will enter into another deep mystery of the Christian faith. That life in the way of Jesus, life as a sacrifice to God, life in this way cannot be defeated by death. Amen.